Hello, my name is Darren Reedy. I am the manager of welcoming and inclusive communities with the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, or as we also refer to it as the AUMA. Welcome to our webinar on how to support transgender employees. This webinar is part of our welcoming and inclusive communities initiative, which aims to provide municipal governments with tools, resources, and information to help implement policies and practices that will help overcome issues of racism and discrimination. The WIC initiative has been in place for over 10 years, and it is inspiring to see the advancements that many municipalities have made over that same time period in becoming more inclusive. We hope that today's presentation will offer insight and inspiration to help you take steps to support transgender employees, as well as persons in the community. We are pleased to have three very knowledgeable speakers on the subject. We are joined by Sushila Sami of the Alberta Human Rights Commission, who will speak about the legal aspects of accommodation of gender identity and gender expression. Natalie Nielsen of the City of Red Deer will speak about her experience transitioning while being employed with the city and Christy Savoia of the City of Red Deer will speak about how the city supported Natalie and the impact it has had on the organization. Now before I introduce our first speaker, I want to highlight that we are hosting this webinar on October 11th in recognition of National Coming Out Day, which celebrates those that come out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. It is also meant to celebrate those that are allies of the LGBTQ community. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Sushila Sami. Sushila is a diversity specialist for the Alberta Human Rights Commission. She is a chartered professional in human resources. She has extensive experience in human rights education, employment equity, and diversity training. She is a trained facilitator and public speaker and has developed and facilitated numerous workshops for government departments, educational institutions, and the corporate and not-for-profit sectors. So Sheila has received awards and citations for her work in the human rights and diversity area. Most recently in June 2017, her team received the Team Merit Award from Alberta Justice and Solicitor General for the Harassment Prevention Series of Webinars. So Sheila, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Darren. I want to thank AUMA for giving me the opportunity to present with the City of Red Deer. Hello, everyone who has joined us on this webinar. The Alberta Human Rights Act applies to The Alberta Human Rights Act applies to all organizations that fall under provincial jurisdiction. The act is administered by the Alberta Human Rights Commission. The act is primacy legislation. What that means is that if there's any conflict between the Alberta Human Rights Act and any other provincial legislation, the Alberta Human Rights Act takes precedence. The Act speaks about the rights and responsibilities of all those who come under provincial jurisdiction. You may be interested to know that about 85% of all organizations in Alberta fall under provincial jurisdiction. For your information, in today's webinar, the human rights legislation that I will be referring to is the Alberta Human Rights Act. The commission when referenced is the Alberta Human Rights Commission. The Alberta Human Rights Act prohibits discrimination on 15 grounds that are listed on this slide. In today's presentation, we are going to focus on gender identity and gender expression. The Alberta Human Rights Act protects individuals from discrimination in the six areas shown on this slide. In today's presentation, we are going to focus on employment practices, which includes terms and conditions of employment. There are two prohibitions in the Act. One, the Act prohibits retaliation. An employer cannot take any negative action against an employee for making a complaint, trying to make a complaint, giving information about a complaint, or helping someone else make a complaint. For example, if an employee provides information as a witness in the investigation of a complaint, the employer cannot take any negative action against that employee. Two, the Act also prohibits individuals from making complaints with malicious intent that are frivolous, that is, it has no merit whatsoever, or vexatious, it is made only to harass others.
The government of Alberta amended the Alberta Human Rights Act in December 2015 to add gender identity and gender expression as express, expressly prohibited grounds of discrimination. Prior to 2015, gender identity and gender expression were included in the ground of gender. Therefore, the Commission was taking complaints of discrimination from trans individuals on the ground of gender. With the inclusion of these two grounds of gender identity and gender expression, the complaints are taken on these grounds now. The Commission describes gender identity as referring to a person's internal, individual experience of gender, which may not coincide with the sex assigned to them at birth. A person may have a sense of being a man, a woman, both or neither. Gender identity is not the same as sexual orientation, which is also protected under the legislation. The Commission describes gender expression as the varied ways in which a person expresses their gender, which can include a combination of dress, grooming, demeanor, social behavior, and other factors. We often hear the term transgender or trans. This is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity or gender expression is different from those typically associated with the biological sex assigned to them at birth. Cisgender relates to someone whose sense of personal identity and gender corresponds with their sex at birth. That is someone who is born female and identifies as female or born as a male and identifies as male. When we talk about discrimination, discrimination happens when a rule, policy, standard or action impacts negatively or disproportionately on an individual or group of individuals based on the protected grounds and a protected area in the act. For example, an employer has a policy that only allows employees who have a disability to take medical leave. The employer denies medical leave to an employee who is transitioning and requires medical time off. In this case, the employer's policy has an adverse impact on the trans employee. The policy is discriminatory and needs to be changed to make it inclusive. Discrimination can happen in one or more grounds of the Act. For example, a trans employee is denied leave to take care of their spouse who is very ill. In this case, the employee is discriminated against on the grounds of gender identity and or gender expression and marital status. So those are two or three grounds that, the, that discrimination has occurred. Further, intent is not required to show discrimination. It is the adverse impact the policy standard or behavior has on the individual. For example, a coworker regularly makes offensive jokes about trans employees. Even though the person making the joke may not intend to discriminate and may think it is harmless, it could be harassment and have a negative impact on employees in the workplace. Examples of discrimination in the workplace include making gen negative gender related comments about an employee's physical characteristics, such as offensive jokes about a person's body or appearance, treating someone badly because they don't conform with our perception of gender roles, refusing to work with a coworker because of their gender identity or gender expression. Other examples include not accommodating an employee for gender conforming surgery and refusing to use the names and pronouns that the employee prefers and continuing to use he and she against their preference. Not, cha not changing employment related documents to reflect name changes of trans employees. The employer is obligated, has several, has three main obligations. They are obligated to maintain a safe, healthy workplace free of harassment. They are liable for harassment in the workplace and are required to take action as soon as they are aware of the harassment. 
and they are required to accommodate employees to the point of undue hardship. So what is harassment? Harassment is a form of discrimination based on one or more of the 15 grounds in the act that we saw earlier. It occurs when someone is subjected to unwelcome and uninvited verbal, non-verbal or physical conduct. It creates a hostile or intimidating work environment, not only for the person being harassed, but for all employees in the workplace. The three-part webcast on the harassment pre prevention series on the Commission's e-learning page provides detailed information on preventing harassment. And it's provided on the slide later on. The duty to accommodate refers to an employee's obligation to take appropriate steps to eliminate discrimination against employees and potential employees. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled that an employer has a legal duty to take reasonable steps to the point of undue hardship to adopt policies and conditions of employment to accommodate an employee's individual needs because based on a protected ground. For example, when an employee on the grounds of gender identity and or gender expression needs medical time off work for surgery, the employer has an obligation to accommodate the employee or to show undue hardship if unable to accommodate. The three-part webcast on the duty to accommodate series on the Commission's e-learning page provides more information on this obligation and it's provided later on in, a, in, in the slide. Workplaces must be safe, inclusive environments for all employees, including trans employees. Some ways to create inclusion is to create policies that em emphasize respect and foster inclusion. Lead by example. Role model the behavior you expect your employees to follow. Protect the privacy and confidentiality of the employee. Release information when required only in consultation with the employee. Know your legal, legal obligations, such as providing accommodation when an employee needs it or show undue hardship if unable to provide the accommodation. And keep the workplace free of harassment. Provide accommodation to all staff on being respectful and inclusive. Be aware of what is happening in the workplace and take action when there is inappropriate behavior. Provide safe access to washroom and other facilities. Collect personal information such as gender markers, Miss, Mr, Mrs, only if you need it, and use a person's preferred name and gender in all documents. Dress code policies should be based on work-related criteria and not on gender stereotypes. Medical information should only be required when an employee needs time off work for gender transition. Otherwise, medical information should not be required. If you have questions about a specific situation you are involved with, you may call the Commission's Confidential Inquiry Line at 780-427. 7661 for those living north of Red Deer, 403-297-6571 for those living in Red Deer and South. To call toll-free, dial 310-0000 and area code and phone number to be connected. More, inf More information is available on the Commission's website at www.albertahumanrights.ab.ca where you can find information sheets, video scenarios, and webcasts, which are all available for free download. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Sushila. Our next speaker is Natalie Nielsen, who is an application systems analyst working in IT services for the city of Red Deer. She supports the City of Red Deer Council Chambers technology during council and budget meetings. 
is the analyst and developer for the City of Red Deer Municipal Census, document management system, time entry system, agenda management system, and a range of other applications used within the city. More personally, Natalie is a self-proclaimed foodie, a lover of geek culture, including both Star Wars and Star Trek, French Bulldogs, video games, and sarcasm. She disconnects from the world of technology by going camping with her six-year-old son, riding ATVs, relaxing at a beach, playing a high-score round of golf, or a low-score game of bowling. Recently, she has become less of a stereotypical introvert, getting involved at the Central Alberta Pride Society, and actually talking to people about her life and experiences. Along with that comes the pleasure of feeling only slightly less awkward when people read her self-glorifying introduction. And yes, she wrote this. Natalie, please proceed with your presentation. Hi, everybody. Can, can you hear me? Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about my personal journey coming out here at the City of Red Deer and what I did when I came out. Uh, I think the majority of people like to believe that we are, humans are simple and that if you see someone of one sex, then you automatically know all sorts of things about that person. You can put a label on them, throw them in a box with a bunch of other people, then label that box with more labels. It's an easy way to categorize and sort through a convoluted world. Male, not supposed to cry, likes beer, works to provide for his family. And when labels don't apply, people get confused and angry. Uh, when I saw that I didn't fit into the, my assigned box with all of those labels, I got confused. Some trans people struggle with the physical aspect of their body. That is the being trapped in the wrong body narrative that's so popular. And it's popular because it's easy. And quite frankly, it fits a lot of people's experiences to some degree. For myself, it started more with the social aspect how an individual's life is governed by society's implied rules of behavior. Those rules inherited by getting the man label at birth. My initial break in thinking happened during my teens around this and it made me research what being transgender meant. How I should be, how the rules of acting as a man should act were wrong. They felt wrong. It felt like I was playing a role written by somebody else instead of being able to be and act who I really am. Act natural was something I couldn't do if I tried. It was an oxymoron, kind of like a fun run or a virgin daiquiri. I just couldn't do it. The challenge was accepting myself and getting over the shame I held. I was conditioned growing up to believe that someone like me was worthy of ridicule by shows that are out there like Maury and Jerry Springer by men in dress jokes, by CD masculine transvestite workers in movies, and by not knowing any trans people, I based my idea of what they were on what the world presented to me through that media. What type of person would willfully put themselves through the hatred, laughter, and discrimination shown if they could avoid it? I then had to pry myself apart to tear that idea out of my head, down to a literal sobbing mess on the bathroom floor. At that point, it was a pretty easy decision to transition and talk to somebody. I'd actually been in transition for almost two years before coming out at work. At the start of those two years, I had dealt with educating myself, uh, playing with my gender expression in private, starting hair removal, weight loss, coming out to my immediate family. I took baby steps into transition and went to counseling to deal with my fears about coming out. Those fears were the fear of losing my marriage, losing my family, losing friends, not seeing my son, and losing my job. These are actually very real consequences for people who come out as trans, even in 2017. Alleviating the fear of losing your job can be reduced by having a guideline for transitioning employees. I would have likely came out sooner at work if our organization had one in place. Small gender deviances can cause a strange reaction from people, men wearing mascara, growing long nails, even painting toes is seen as, seen as shameful. It attracts attention. I would actually show up with mascara, long nails, and light makeup while presenting as male. Allowing that exploration of gender, even as small as that is, openly in a workplace without ridicule, is a huge indicator of support. 
People may do this uh, before transitioning to test the waters. At the end of those two years, I gained some confidence and my appearance had changed significantly enough for me to force myself to come out at work. Unlike being gay or lesbian, transitioning physically will be a noticeable change as an employee goes through it. I honestly don't know how I wasn't outed as trans before notifying my supervisor. I'd read and heard lots of stories of people who came out in the workplace only to be let go within a month due to job performance. And that would be job performance in air quotes, since you can't see my hands. Uh, long exaggerated air quotes. Others came out with perceived support only to be let go due to job performance, again in air quotes, after they started hormones, their appearance began to change and other people got uncomfortable. Even positive coming out stories in the workplace sometimes had endings where the transitioning employee was no longer being given meaningful work or included on projects or involved in social gatherings. And this may have been intentional or subconscious isolation, but the effect was the same. Air quote, job performance suffered and the employee was eventually let go. For me, having a place, plan in place to transition on the job correctly was important. It's a big change, so I researched and found a few cases of successful workplace transitions. Those documents became my plan. First, I informed my employer that I am transgender and my plan to physically transition to female. I came out to my immediate supervisor as that was the person I was most comfortable with, but it could involve HR or the employee's manager. Because we didn't have a transition policy in place, I supplied some guide documents about successful transitions from Alberta Health Services, amongst some others. Confidentiali confidentiality is important in this stage, especially if strategies and policies are not in place to deal with the concerns of others, or it's a fairly homogenous environment without much diversity. It may be necessary to have a team of people come up with strategies before the transitioning person comes out, and if you don't have these in place, then you might be in a rush to develop them in the future. Uh, a date was picked by me with consultation from management so I could publicly change my gender expression at work. Uh, this should require some time away from the job. How that happens depends on the company. I took time off to complete cosmetic surgery to be seen as my gender, as well as to begin legal name, gender, and sex marker changes. More importantly, this step allows other employees time to adjust to the idea. During that time off, the employer informs other employees or clients who works directly with the transitioning employee of the change in name, pronoun, or appearance, or whatever is appropriate for that person's transition plan. They educate how to support the transitioning employee, quell any fears, and I provided a letter to my coworkers to be read at a, as a meeting as an explanation of what I was doing, what my new name was, my pronouns, and it made things more personal for them to hear it in my own words. They could get an understanding of where I was coming from, what the process was for me, and reaffirming that, hey, I'm still the same person you've worked with for the last three years. Management needs to model and communicate the desired behavior. They set the example, and people in authority positions should be coached to model that respectful behavior. Also realize that sometimes it's not really the transitioning employee who changes the most, it's the perception of them that changes. If there's a lot of concern, uh, a workshop can be held on being an inclusive environment. We hold generic diversity and inclusion sessions as well as specialized ones for various groups, gender identity being one of them. Also during that time off, the employer makes changes to the employee records for names and gender or sex where necessary. Uh, this can include email, nameplates, business cards, staff directories, anywhere where a legal ch name change isn't really necessary. Legal systems like payroll can be changed later uh, once the employee decides to do that, if they do decide to do that. The transitioning employee then returns to work as their gender, ideally with the support of everyone. And any complaints at that point should be investigated and dealt with whether they are directed at the transitioning employee or at others, and you can use the in-place procedures to do that. Uh, do's and don'ts while going through this are pretty basic. Don't ask transgender people about their genitals or surgery plans in this area. This should be obvious, but it's actually a ridiculously common question that I get once in a while. 
unless you're in a relationship with a trans person, it really doesn't matter. If you wouldn't ask a cisgender person about their junk, why would it be appropriate to ask a trans person? The exception is if the person is undergoing surgery and it may require time away from work. In that case, they should talk to HR about time off and recovery. Uh, two, don't ask about birth names or dead name someone. Dead naming means calling someone their old name and often it's used as a way to invalidate trans people's identities. Uh, three, pronouns matter and when you use the wrong ones, it's called misgendering. It's a hard one. Uh, when someone you know is coming out, it's really tough to switch pronouns from he to she or they. I struggle with it and everyone struggles with it. Uh, the important thing with pronouns and names is to try. The person in transition can't expect people to get it immediately. Unintentional misgendering will happen. Just don't make a big deal of it. Move on, be aware, and try harder next time. Uh, but also realize that intentional misgendering is a major issue. Again, invalidating our identity. Uh, fourth, don't out people. This should be obvious as well, but so outing someone as trans can cause harm, and not everyone who has transitioned is visibly transgender. Many people live their daily lives without anyone knowing. Just because they let tell somebody doesn't mean that it's now free to share to anyone. We don't live in a perfectly understanding world, and it can affect relationships with those people who are uncomfortable with someone like me. It can actually even be fatal. Uh, trans people are still murdered at a disproportionate rate, especially trans women of color. Five, actively involve them in discussions and social events. Transitioning can make some people feel out of place or prevent them from engaging as much as they used to. Be aware of some subconscious biased decisions, one that are out of employees' control but may impact their performance, things like work assignments, team assignments. Keep them busy. A wandering mind can be terrible to deal with, especially at the start of a transition and during a time of fear in coming out. Be aware of other people's changing perceptions and actions. Everyone's tolerance level, tolerance level for misgendering dead naming and small things is different. For some people, it can impact their day and their performance. For others, it might not have any effect. It also helps to be aware that transition may mean something different for other people. For genderqueer individuals, it could mean changing their clothes, hair, mannerisms to become more natural to them, possibly changing their name or gender markers on ID. It could, all, could mean hormone therapy, changes in sex and gender markers, hair removal, new wardrobes, uh, surgery to change their body to match their gender. Uh, that can include mastectomy, breast augmentation, facial surgery, body contouring, and gender reassignment surgery. It's important to note that transition doesn't necessarily or always involve reassignment surgery. Many people choose not to undertake these for personal reasons, and they just don't need to. Maybe they have medical reasons that they can't. Another reason somebody may choose a different transition path are finances. It can be expensive, considering the expenses in areas where uh, transitioning costs aren't covered by insurance, like new wardrobes, surgeries, hair removal, cost of name and gender change, loss of work time, uh, hormone costs, it's pretty easy to see why some people can't afford to transition or can't afford to transition in the way that they want to. It's important to understand that as an employer with a transitioning employee, there are vast differences in transition goals, timelines, and the means they have to, to uh, achieve their desired outcome. So it means that just because his license says Ashley doesn't mean he's lying to you when he says his name is Jack. Insisting on calling a man a woman because of a body he's very uncomfortable with can be psychologically damaging. You don't know that person's situation. Maybe he can't afford hormones at this time. Maybe he has an unsupportive family and he feels unsafe to transition in other areas of his life. Every transition is different and can take different amounts of time. If a transitioning employee can't afford to remove a beard, which isn't covered by healthcare, she's still a woman, People in transition deserve all the courtesies normally directed to anyone in that gender, uh, even small courtesies. If you're a trans man, get used to people holding, less people holding the door for you. And if we're really honest, trade that for some easier salary negotiations. Since transitioning, I have now been let off with, a, with two speeding ticket warnings.
and I had never been let off with one before then. So there may be a bit of a police bias there towards women. Uh, I'm extremely lucky. There have been no negative account encounters with people at work, only uh, uninformed questions. So despite the barriers that come with transition, uh, mostly mental barriers, I'm glad that I did and I'm glad I did it later in life. The only negative outcome was the loss of my marriage and some social reshuffling. I'm lucky that I'm seen now as mostly a cisgender woman in public and I don't really experience the glances, stares, whispers, and hate that some visibly trans or non-binary people face. Uh, I'm privileged to live in Canada where gendered identity is protect protected. I'm privileged to be employed in a union at the city of Red Deer. I'm privileged that I saved enough money to afford uh, everything I needed to transition to be who I wanted to be and see a face I want in the mirror when I wake up every morning. I'm privileged that my mom introduces me as her daughter. I'm privileged to have been able to come out at work and transition in a supportive environment and remain in a role where I'm effective to my employer, working with the same people for the last six years now. Uh, unfortunately, my story is not the type of story we usually hear about. Many people can't get a job because they're visibly trans or they don't fit into a gender box. Many people can't get jobs in their field of expertise due to being visibly trans, so they take lower paying work or service industry jobs. The sad statistic is between 35 and 50% of trans people have had suicidal thoughts. Family support, especially parents when transitioning even later in life drops that statistic in half. The ability to change documentation like birth certificates, driver's licenses, workplace documents contributes to quality of life as well. Those who experience low levels of misgendering, microaggressions, dead naming, and trans-based hate are even happier. Lastly, the ability to transition more closely to a desired state uh, improves the quality of life for the transitioning employee. Any help a workplace can give in these areas to support transitioning employees will improve the quality of life for those employees and pr promote employee retention. There's a lot of educating to be done, uh, but there's a lot more understanding now than even five years ago when I started all of this. And the number of people having questions and wanting to do the right now thing now is inspiring. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Darren. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, great presentation. Our final speaker is Christy Svoboda. <laughs> Sorry, Svoboda. Um, as a passionate champion of people, Christy is the uh, Christy is the director of human resources for the city of Red Deer. Uh, she brings to her professional practice over 20 years of leadership experience in labor relations, training and development, recruitment, performance management, workforce and succession planning, and planning and policy development. Her experience includes healthcare, education, mental health, and the last 10 years with the city. Christy cares about creating sustainable workplaces through positive, productive, and respectful relationships. She leads a diverse group of, of professionals that provides HR services to a large organization of 1,600 people. On a personal note, she's a sensei, third generation proud uh, Japanese Canadian. She loves her other job of mom to two adult children and strives to always have a better balance with work, family, and yoga. Christy, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Darren. Good afternoon. I am honored to be invited to present the City of Red Deer's work on supporting transgendering employees through their transitioning process. The city went through the process with one of our employees back in 2015. It was a very positive learning experience for everyone involved and has had a great and positive impact on our organization. And I think I can safely say the employee themselves. In my presentation, I will share how we supported the employee, the steps we took, and also the impact on the organization. The city is also sharing our new handbook on supporting transitioning employees today as we recognize National Coming Out Day. The process was a collaboration between the Human Resources Department, the Employees Department, 
and the employee. Everything that happened was driven by the employee as their wishes were the most important thing to consider. We were there to support the employee. We didn't, necess we didn't necessarily know what that meant and left it to the employee to advise what their needs were. Communication is key with the employee so that they knew what was going to be communicated to whom and when. We discussed and planned the timing and the communication, all driven by the employee. Respect and privacy were at the forefront of everyone who was supporting and as uh, the transitioned employee worked through their transition in their personal and professional life, others in the department, not just the manager and supervisor, but we were all involved. We were helping the employee in confidence, respecting the employee's confidence, privacy. We wanted to ensure that that staff, co-workers, uh, the clientele were respectful. Uh, we were listening and wanting to do what would be best for the employee. We wanted to ensure that we maintained a respectful workplace. Yes, there were consideration of human rights and legislation, but for us it was mainly about doing the right thing for the employee. When you state that you are an organization that supports diversity and inclusion, you must walk the talk. We are proud that we were able to support our employee to the best of our ability and others have been made aware of this as well. It has been an informative learning experience that has impacted our organization in many ways. You must take into account cultural processes of your organization. We have a respectful workplace policy and procedure. We promote diversity and inclusion. What does that mean? It means these cannot just be a check mark in a box. It means a better, safer environment for meaningful conversations. It means important questions get asked and answered. In May of 2016, the City of Red Deer hosted the Fostering Diverse Communities Conference and the employees shared their experience at the breakout session titled, The Transgender Experience. It was very well received. The employee also spoke to the city's internal diversity team and presented their story at the Alberta Human Rights Commission's Community Forum on Gender Identity and Expression in Service and Employment during Central Alberta Pride Week this year. We have an internal diversity program and we also consult with the employee on um, language that we use in our census and also to ensure that we're um, being respectful and consider their perspective on gender neutral washroom signage. When we started working on the transition, there, uh, this transitioning uh, book, handbook, sorry, there wasn't a lot of information as well about the and just from a human resources perspective in the industry on supporting transgender employees and we relied heavily upon a document that had been shared uh, with the employee by another transgender person who had gone through the process uh, with their employer. I think uh, Natalie referred to that uh, uh, Alberta Health Services employee. So we created our own handbook for supervisors and managers to support any future transitioning employees. It was developed from the shared document with suggestions from our employee. It includes steps to consider when supporting employees, appropriate coworker conduct, resources, it includes letter templates for communicating with staff and others, and also a glossary of terms. Privacy and confidentiality are also covered along with job-related planning, considerations like wash washroom usage and correct pronouns and names. From the human resources perspective, records considerations are also included. We're making our handbook available today to those who would like uh, to reference it or adapt it for your organization. To receive a copy, please contact Tamara Shikalski, our diversity and inclusion specialist. And with that, 
I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Okay, thank you, Christy. Uh, now it's time for the audience to ask any questions that you have. So on the bottom right, again, if you haven't opened the chat box, there's a little purple label on the bottom right. You can click on that, it'll open up, and you'll see the chat box, which is represented by a, a little, I guess, bubble on the bottom left. Uh, feel free to type in any of your questions, and if they are directed towards this particular speaker, please indicate who that is. Um, until any questions come forward, uh, I think I might ask one on in, in advance. Um, I'm wondering if Natalie or Christy can speak to elaborate a bit more on the process in educating other staff uh, about that process. Uh, Natalie talked about a letter being shared. I'm curious uh, what that environment looked like in terms of the number of employees that were involved in that education um, and maybe elaborate on how you talked about the use of pronouns. Thanks Darren, it's Christy. I um, really first of all with regards to the collaboration and the planning it was you know we really wanted uh, to be respectful of Natalie's wishes and so uh, just with regards to communication we we had conversations with her supervisors and manager uh, just to ensure that um, uh, the timing was at her request and also um, who were we, were we going to be um, communicating with and so we wanted to ensure that uh, Natalie was comfortable with the information that was going to be shared. I think she also had indicated that she wanted some information um, provided to her coworkers. And also the manager had sent out some information to the department. Um, just really providing um, some information, some um, just go forward and some expectations as well just in terms of uh, uh, what Natalie's preference uh, preferences were and that uh, that we were really asking to be supportive and have a respectful workplace and I can I can share that we we do have a culture of respect and that we were there to be to help support Natalie through her processes and also really wanting her to drive the communication pieces. We didn't have any issues of uh, um, intentional disrespect and um, I think that that we also learned a lot through the through the process. Okay, thank you. We have one question that's come in. Uh, it, it states, just a general question about whether either of the speakers have knowledge about how transgender surgery would be supported by benefits. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to take this, but anybody feel free to step in. Hi, Danielle, it's Christy. And just through our employee disability support plan, um, Surgery is surgery, whether it is elective or not. And so um, it was, it, from our perspective, it wasn't even a question because it was just supported by our, our uh, benefit plan. I can add a little bit onto that as well. Uh, living in Alberta, the only part of transitioning that is covered by Alberta Healthcare is gender reassignment surgery. So that actually leaves a lot of financial burden on the transitioning employee to cover themselves. Uh, and I'm grateful that I had the city of Red Deer here because the, the surgery that I went through was called facial feminization surgery, which was the original one I went for. And it is technically considered a cosmetic surgery. So having that extended disability for me 
allowed me to take the proper amount of time off work to get that done without uh, worrying about the financial implications as much. Thanks, Natalie and Christy. Uh, one of the questions that I received uh, by email prior to this was, are there any resources that municipalities can access around uh, explaining the value of gender ne neutral washrooms? Uh, none that I'm aware of. There might be some. Is, uh, oh, there we go. This is Sushila. Uh, we are at the Human Rights Commission because we are also trying to develop, have some gender neutral washrooms. Uh, we are just in the, in the uh, process of developing some policies and guidelines about that so we can take that to talk to the building management, for example. So we are in the process. I'm going to jump in and give some opinion on this one here. Uh, we have schools in our area and other facilities that have had gender neutral washrooms and the signage can cause a bit of a debate uh, depending how it's presented. So we've had it where it says uh, gender neutral washroom or all gender washroom or whatever else. I always kind of default to function over description. So if it's a gender neutral washroom, uh, it doesn't really be, need to be labeled as such. It's just a washroom. And I, I kind of have to keep pushing that because if somebody sees gender neutral washroom, they tend to um, get on guard for that, or some people do anyway. So that's just my opinion on the signage. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, not seeing any more questions at this time. Again, if you, I'm going to move on and talk about a couple of resources. But um, if you still have any more questions, please feel free to type them in, and we can we can address them. Um, but in the meantime, until until such thing comes forward, uh, I want to highlight that AMA's welcoming and inclusive communities website has recent, recently been reorganized and updated with new content. Uh, this particular webinar will be posted there in the next week as well. Uh, within the site, we offer a variety of tools uh, to help municipalities and, and communities, uh, organizations. Uh, examples include our welcoming and inclusive communities toolkit, which offers guidance on building a strategic plan. Our measuring inclusion tool allows you to evaluate and rate how inclusive your municipality and community is across 15 different areas from human resource policies to public attitudes um, to infrastructure to social services. Uh, it's quite a broad range of dimensions. The planning together guide helps you develop an action plan to attract and retain newcomers. If you want to build an inclusion committee, which is very common for a lot of municipalities that are approaching uh, diversity and inclusion work, we offer a guide on creating a terms of reference. And if you want to build a campaign, we have a kit that includes templates for posters and signs and arena boards and, and uh, newspaper ads and whatnot. Lastly, if you find you're struggling with any of the terminology you heard today or, or if you wondered what something means, uh, check out our glossary of terms for definitions. Um, I find it's a very helpful document. And all of these tools can be accessed for free at WIC, which is wic.auma.ca. Our site also includes links to past webinars that we've had on various issues from uh, refugee experiences and uh, developing strategic plans, uh, strategic frameworks, which was also uh, presented by the City of Red Deer last December. So not seeing any more questions uh, with that, I'd like to once again thank Cecilia, Natalie, and Christy for taking the time to discuss how to support transgender employees. I'd also like to thank all of you for your participation. And if you have any more questions about this webinar or want to engage with our WIC initiative, please contact me at WIC at auma.ca. We look forward to hosting future webinars. And just a reminder that AUMA's annual convention is upcoming in Calgary on November 22nd to the 24th. Thank you and have a great day.